good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before starting the plenary session this morning, I have an announcement regarding the uh, quadrocopter public lecture uh, this afternoon. Uh, there are two notes. The first one is that you need to have the code PL on the back of your name tag or ticket in order to attend the uh, public lecture. Uh, tickets are available at registration. The second note is that a few of the tickets already in circulation have the incorrect time of the uh, lecture. Please note that the demonstration begins uh, promptly at uh, quarter past three in this afternoon. Okay, it's a time of uh, starting the last plenary lecture, plenary seminar of the 19th IFAC World Congress in Cape Town. My name is Shinji Hara from the University of Tokyo. It's my great pleasure and honor to chair this plenary session. The speaker of this plenary is Professor Richard Murray from California Institute of Technology in the United States. Uh, let me briefly introduce him before his talk. Richard Murray received the PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer sciences from the University of California at Berkeley in 1991. He is currently the Thomas E. and Doris Everhart Professor of Control and Dynamical Systems and Bioengineering at Caltech. Mary received several awards, including the Ekman Award from the American Automatic Control Council, A Square, C Square, in 1997. He is a hero of IEEE. He currently organizes several big projects, both in control and in biology, uh, which includes analysis and design by molecular feedback circuits, novel architecture for control using slow computing, and specification, verification, and synthesis of networked control systems. The last one is actually related to his talk this morning. Richard, please. Thank you, Shinji, for that uh, kind introduction. Well, it's my pleasure to be here this morning, uh, and I'd like to uh, thank the organizers and Ian Craig uh, for giving me the honor of speaking here. Um, it's been a great conference, uh, and uh, I'd like to congratulate them uh, on a wonderful organization. So I wanted to uh, talk this morning about some of the work that we've been doing uh, over the last 10 years or so uh, in the area of specification, verification, and synthesis of network control systems. Uh, and I uh, wanted to thank in particular a uh, former PhD student, Nak Wong Piramsarn, uh, and a former postdoc, Ufuk Topku, who contributed uh, greatly to this work. So what I'd like to uh, tell you about today is motivated by some work that we did on the DARPA Grand Challenge, which some of you have heard me speak about before. Uh, that uh, we worked on at Caltech between about 2004 and 2007. Uh, and this is the vehicle that we built. This is a truck called Alice. Uh, so if you hear me talk about Alice did this or Alice did that, uh, that's what I mean. Uh, so Alice is a completely autonomous vehicle. Uh, it was built by a bunch of Caltech undergraduates, about 75 Caltech undergraduates working as a team. Uh, you're seeing it here in its desert configuration. So the DARPA Grand Challenge had a number of iterations, including a uh, race in the desert, 150 miles completely autonomously in the desert, uh, as well as an urban configuration, which you'll see uh, a little bit later, uh, in which it was driving uh, on roads in cities. 
So Alice was a truck that we built uh, that uh, was able to drive itself. It had a number of uh, sensors, so as you see, sort of eight cameras, LADARs, uh, laser range finders, radars. Um, what was interesting about it was uh, the software control system for it. Uh, it used uh, a dozen different computers, all connected together by three one gigabit per second Ethernet networks, uh, running over 25 different programs with about 200 autonomous threads of execution. So in, in very much a network control system in terms of the way that everything connected together. Uh, and we wrote about 250,000 lines of code sitting on top of millions of lines uh, of open source code uh, in order to get this to work. So Alice was very eye-opening uh, in a number of ways. One was in what you could actually do with modern controls technology and modern sensing technology and modern computing uh, in terms of getting autonomous vehicles to go. Uh, and as many of you know, the DARPA Grand Challenge really kicked off uh, the types of things that we see in autonomous vehicles today. So a number of the alumni uh, from the broad uh, DARPA Grand Challenge, all of the teams now work at Google, for example, uh, working on Google autonomous cars. But at the time that we were doing this, it wasn't clear that you could actually get cars to drive around. They'd been done in Germany and other places, but to really get them to work in in uh, urban environments routinely with the type of computing that was available uh, was something that I think was very eye-opening. Uh, the other thing that was very eye-opening was what worked and what didn't uh, and what uh, new challenges there were for control. So let me show you a little bit about what Alice uh, did and this is from Alice's point of view. And so I'm going to show you a couple of short video clips uh, and these video clips uh, kind of are uh, Alice uh, at the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2007 in some of the qualification rounds showing the types of tasks that uh, it had to satisfy. So this is Alice driving along some roads, uh, coming up to an intersection. You see there are three cars that are already at the intersection. It has to wait until those cars go, uh, and it has to keep track of which cars got there before I did. Uh, and then once it's its turn to go, uh, then it can drive through the intersection. This is all autonomous. It's having to figure out. It doesn't actually know exactly where the road is. It has to figure out where the lanes are. Uh, it knows there's a road there. It's a two-way road, but exactly where the lane lines are and other things, it has to figure out autonomously as it's driving along. Here it comes up to another intersection. Uh, this time there's a car in front of it. It has to wait. It's waiting far back because that's the specification. Uh, once this car goes through the intersection, it's able to pull up to the intersection. It has to stop at the stop line. There's another car there. That car got here first. Uh, and so we wait until it goes, and then we can drive through. So this is very much a feedback control system, right? We're sensing things about our environment. We're making decisions about what to do. Uh, and then we're implementing those decisions. But it's an example of something that isn't just a sort of PID loop uh, with uh, anti windup that's going to solve this, right? I mean, it's a different level of abstraction in terms of what's going on. Uh, and I think that's part of what makes these uh, interesting is it's, it's a dynamical system. Uh, you have to control it. You have to keep it on the road, all those things. But you also have to decide, you know, what do I do if the car in front of me starts moving and then stops moving? And now, you know, should I stop? Should I keep going? What should I do? So. Uh, that's an example of Alice doing what we told it to do. Uh, let me show you another example where things didn't go quite as well. Um, this is another intersection uh, uh, challenge. This time we have to merge into an intersection that has cars going back and forth. And so here what you see is we're coming up to an intersection, but now there are cars going back and forth. And so we have to wait until there's an opening. And once we see an opening, then we can proceed through the intersection. And so Alice sees an opening, starts to proceed through. Notice there's a car over on the left there, all right? And now Alice says, I can't actually make it. That car backs up, all right? And now Alice says, okay, I'll go forward. So the question you should ask is, what's the control system doing at this point, right? That's probably not something we expected, right? That, you know, you'd sort of get stuck in the intersection, and then the other car would back up, and then you would keep driving, right? And yet it sort of did the right thing, right? You can argue it did the wrong thing because it didn't make the corner. It didn't judge correctly uh, whether it could turn the corner. Uh, here's another one where it cuts into this lane and stops. That's not legal motion. What's going on there, right? So... This was a vehicle that we uh, built with the best tools that we had available. We tested it like crazy, right? 300 miles of autonomous driving. Uh, when we went to the DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, we thought we could do all of the types of driving that was there. Uh, and in fact, this last run uh, demonstrated to us that there were bugs in our code uh, someplace, or, or bugs in our design, right? I mean, it wasn't that you know, there was some syntax error in the code someplace. Uh, it was a little more subtle than that. So let me show you what the uh, control system for that looked like. Here's kind of a block diagram view. Um, and so in this block diagram view, uh, what you see is it's, it's a relatively uh, simple block diagram for a system of this complexity. Uh, so what you see is that over here are the sensing systems. Uh, so these are all of the systems that are used uh, to gather the data from the sensors and to represent it. Uh, and so the sensors are on the far left. Uh, then we have a number of uh, software programs that run that extract different features that are important. Uh, and finally, it goes into this map. It is our representation of the world around us. Uh, the navigation system, or the control system, if you want, or the uh, thing we would think of as the control system, is sitting here. 
Uh, and it's broken into a number of layers. So we start at a very high level with some mission planner. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get to the airport. And after we get to the airport, we want to stop by the hotel or whatever. There's a traffic planner. The traffic planner worries about, uh, can I drive uh, in this lane? Can I change lanes? I'm in an intersection. Is it time to go through the intersection? All of those types of decisions. Uh, the path planner is a, a receding horizon, real-time trajectory generation uh, based path planner, uh, as you might expect. The path follower is a PID controller with anti-windup, uh, and then, of course, the actual system itself. And so there's lots of feedback loops that are running in here, but of course this whole system is also a big feedback system. That is, as we move in the environment, the environment reacts to us, and we have to sense the environment and make changes in what we do based on what we see around us. And so we made use of uh, a lot of different uh, technologies we were doing this. We made use of receding horizon control, multi-layer sensor fusion, uh, different types of real-time trajectory generation and receding horizon control. Uh, the low-level controllers, the, the, the lowest level feedback controllers, were uh, what we teach everybody right at the very beginning, uh, PID control uh, with anti windup compensation. Um, this was a good example of a networked control system for us because uh, it had 12 different computers, as I said, running over multiple uh, Ethernet networks uh, that were talking to each other. There were 25 processes that are running. These are all running on different computers, running on Linux, uh, and so they're all running independently. The color code that you see is uh, sort of my indication of where we had to do some work. So the things that are green are more or less the things that we were able to just take standard off-the-shelf technology theory, apply it, it did what it was supposed to do. So, for example, for the most part, uh, the, the feedback control was straightforward. There, you know, that was an easy problem to solve. The things that are yellow are things that we had to customize a little bit. So, for example, the model predictive controller and the real-time trajectory generation, the theory worked fine, but we had to figure out how to get it to run fast enough. We ran those at about 100 hertz update rate. Uh, and so how do you calculate where in the lane should I be and what should I do about obstacles that are around me uh, at that rate? The things that are red are the things that really we had to uh, invent, uh, and maybe hack would be a better word, uh, in the sense that you know, we implemented these, uh, but we felt like we were just uh, doing it by the seat of our pants. There was no real theory to guide us. Uh, we were trying to be good engineers. We were trying to get those things to work. Um, and then we were testing them like crazy and hoping that they worked. And so in the, there, were, there were parts over here, for example, how do you uh, detect uh, obstacles and track them? So if you have a moving obstacle, how do you know if something's moving or stopped, a car stops, is it now a static obstacle or do I need to think about it as a vehicle and wait until it moves? Uh, things like that required some customization. In the navigation stack up here, you see that the things that are at the higher levels of abstraction uh, were some of the things that we struggled with a little bit and had to figure out uh, how to control. So, this uh, system was one uh, that gave us a lot of insight into what control theory could do uh, and some of the places where it had challenges. And so if we think about how we might uh, design a control system like this, of course one does it across a number of layers of abstraction and using a number of different mathematical models. And so we can think about this as a problem where we say, okay, we have a dynamical system. Uh, it might be multiple dynamical systems. This might be multiple vehicles or multiple subsystems within a single vehicle. Uh, it has a continuous set of dynamics that we might describe as using order differential equations uh, and a discrete part. Uh, and so in the discrete part, I've uh, written this as what's called a, called a uh, guarded command system. And so uh, you see the G of X alpha. Uh, this is a guard. It's a true or false statement. If it's true, then that means that the discrete state, which I'll label as alpha, changes and becomes some new discrete state. And this is asynchronous. This is something decides to uh, change based on some rule. And there may be many things in the system uh, that could be doing that. You've got uh, logic that's running at different levels. You've got the environment around you that you also have to model, all of those things. So the system description on the left consists of the continuous state x, perhaps evolving according to a differential equation, the discrete state alpha, perhaps according, uh, evolving according to some guarded command language, uh, or finite transition system, hybrid system uh, types of uh, dynamics. On the right-hand side is the spec, and so here we might want to minimize something, stay in the center of your lane, minimize the distance. We would, of course, have to uh, uh, obey constraints, and so I haven't written here, but there would be constraints that say, you know, stay a certain distance away from obstacles, uh, don't run into things. But there are also a bunch of logical constraints, uh, sort of of the broad form, if x, then y, right? Uh, you know, never do z. Uh, if you're at an intersection, wait until the other cars have cleared, and then when it's your turn, go, right? And I don't know how to write that down as an integral of something, uh, but I certainly know how to write that down in terms of logical statements. So this was the sort of specification. Of course, you don't just design a controller at this level and say, okay, I'm going to just design u equals kx alpha and do it. You break it up into layers. Uh, and so uh, those layers might start, of course, with the physical dynamics. And there's design that goes on here. You have to choose your actuators. You have to choose your sensors. Of course, this is an iteration. Um, at the lowest level, we'll do some sort of tracking control. This is where the you know, kind of classical control, and again, as I mentioned, we use PID, but you can use H infinity or other things. Here, you're trying to do disturbance rejection uh, and different types of robustness at the low level, probably linearized around an operating point. Certainly, that's what we did. 
Um, as you move up uh, in levels of abstraction, you then get to the trajectory layer. Uh, and here we start looking at the nonlinear dynamics with whatever constraints are in place. Uh, and we might uh, do, a, as we did, a receding horizon control uh, as the way to actually uh, solve that problem. And finally, at the decision-making layer uh, is where we have the question about how do you deal with an intersection, right? Uh, how do you make sure that if you start going into an intersection uh, and suddenly another car does something unusual, they stop and they back up, how do you react to that? And here, in terms of how do you specify that behavior, uh, this was one of the things that we struggled with, and it's one of the reasons that that block was read. Um, there were formalisms that were around, and in particular, uh, there, you could write, try and write these down as logical constraints. And so, for example, if you look at mixed logical dynamical systems and other types of techniques, uh, that gives you one way of doing that. Um, there are regular languages and discrete event system types of representations. Um, what we eventually settled on uh, was using some tools from computer science using temporal logics, uh, and in particular, we used uh, something called linear temporal logic. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about linear temporal logic today because we found it to be a very effective tool for specifying the desired behavior of these systems. And I have to say, it's not a tool that's very familiar to most controls audiences. Um, I think it should be more. I think it's a very natural language. It's a very rich mathematical language, uh, and it allows us to do lots of things, as I hope to convince you a little bit today. So if I replace those words uh, with the actual types of specifications we use, uh, it would look something like this. Um, so this may be uh, a little bit Greek looking uh, to some of you. Uh, so uh, this says uh, that uh, some proposition about the initial state of the system, phi init must be true, uh, and always some propositions about the environment must be true. I have to, sat I have to make some assumptions about my environment uh, and the form, that, uh, the behaviors that the environment can implement. So I have to assume something about the other cars. And then under those assumptions that my system initializes correctly and that the environment satisfies some description that I provide, um, I'd like to make sure that I have a system, so that's the implication, uh, that is always, so the square box means always, that is always safe, and so I have some proposition that describes what safety means, and always eventually satisfies some liveness condition, like I always eventually make progress. So I always move forward, I always make it through an intersection, right, at some point in the future. And I'll talk more about this particular mathematical language and, and describe some of these symbols, um, but that was the language that we used to describe this. So what I want to talk to you about today then is how do we do feedback control design at this top layer, right? What does a feedback controller look like when the systems that we're dealing with are happening in terms of discrete abstractions, decision, discrete decision making? And of course we want to couple that to the dynamics of what are going on and so I'll also talk to you about how we take the dynamics into account in designing that discrete abstraction layer. And so for the rest of the lecture then what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about LTL and STL so I can describe this mathematical language uh, that we find very useful for describing this. And then talk about two ways that you might use that for doing control design. The first is what I call design then verify, that is that you design the system and then you need to verify that it works, right? And you want to do something better than 300 miles of testing. Uh, and uh, as some of you heard on Tuesday, right, getting these systems to work correctly is hard. These are very complicated systems. Lots of things can go wrong and, and many of them are safety critical systems and we need to understand how to do that better. And I think there are some great tools out there coming from the computer science community that we can adapt uh, to controls and so I'll tell you a little about that. But then, I want to talk about something that looks more like design, uh, and in particular synthesis, and so I'll tell you about a particular approach uh, that we're using called correct by construction synthesis of reactive controllers. So how do you design a feedback controller uh, in this way? And then if I have some time, I'll make some final thoughts on uh, sort of where we can go from here. Okay, so um, let me say then a little bit about some of the prior work that we build on. So there's a lot of work in control that we can build on. So as I already mentioned, uh, discrete event systems has been thinking about these supervisory control problems mainly on the, on the pure discrete side for quite a while, uh, back since the seminal work of uh, Ramanujan Wanam uh, in 1987. Uh, there's a great uh, overview of that work that's been relatively recently updated uh, uh, by Cassandra and Lafortune. Uh, and in fact, this was the winner of the IFAC Chestnut Award uh, back in 1999, so in fact recognized uh, by this community, that describes some of the many useful tools coming out of discrete event systems. Hybrid systems has also been doing a lot of work in this area, and there's, of course, a long literature in hybrid systems. Um, I pulled out a couple that we've found particularly useful. Uh, one is the work by Bemparad and Murari that was actually recognized at the beginning of this Congress uh, uh, through the IFAC High Impact uh, Paper Award. Um, but also work that has gone on in George Pappas's group uh, with Rajiv Allure, Tom Hensinger, and others uh, in looking at discrete abstractions of hybrid systems, that is, the connection uh, of the continuous dynamics to uh, the discrete layer. 
Now, the two bottom topics, model checking and reactive synthesis, are really coming out of computer science, and we've found those tools to be particularly useful. So model checking is an area that uh, really Ed Clark is one of the fathers of uh, model checking, uh, and so this paper in 1986 uh, is often cited as one of the papers that kind of kicked all of this off. Um, model checking is a very rich area, and uh, this work by Baron Katoon, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong, uh, in Principles of Model Checking is a fantastic book. I, I highly recommend it for everybody who wants to learn about model checking. It's what we use in the courses that I teach, uh, and it really is a great uh, approach. The most recent things uh, that really are what I want to tell you about today come from this idea of reactive synthesis. That is, we want control protocols that make these discrete decisions. Like you might synthesize an LQR controller, we want to synthesize the finite state machine uh, that is a feedback controller for these systems. And so, uh, Amir Punali was the, the kind of father of this area in some sense, passed away a couple of years ago, uh, and he really thought about how do you synthesize these reactive models uh, a long time ago, back in 1989, uh, but it wasn't until 2006 uh, that the results that we needed uh, actually appeared. That is, uh, efficient methods for doing synthesis on a class of problems that are relevant for feedback control. And I wanted to highlight this last paper uh, by Hadas Kreskazit uh, and George uh, Fanekos and, and George Pappas because uh, it's one that uh, was particularly influential on us. It's really where we learned about some of the techniques uh, that we're doing. So there's a lot of prior work that we can build on um, and make use of that to understand what's going on. Okay, so let me tell you the way that we've approached the problem, uh, and that is to use temporal logic as specification language. So temporal logic is a language for describing sequences of events. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, operators in temporal logic, uh, and I've put three of them here. Um, so the diamond means eventually, and that means that some property is true at some point in the future. Now, here we're thinking about uh, discrete behavior and uh, kind of discrete events that are occurring, and at some point in the future doesn't specify a specific time. It just says at some point in the future, a property will be true. The square, the box, means always. Uh, and so we say if a property is always true at all instants in time, uh, now and in the future, uh, then we can put a box and use that to notate that. And the little circle means next, that something is not true now, perhaps could be true, could be not true, but it is true at the very next step. So this is the language of temporal logic. And you can think about this in terms of the sequence of events that you see at the bottom. Uh, so if I say that eventually a property A is true, then I might have, for example, in my sequence of events, kind of indicated by the little circles, the property A is not true, so not A uh, is uh, uh, the state for a while. And then at some point here in the first, fourth uh, uh, sort of state, A becomes true, and then I don't care what happens after that. Once A is true at once, then that's enough, right? It's become true, it was eventually true. Always means something different. Always means that A is true at every instant in time, whatever that uh, uh, true-false statement is. So if I say I always want to maintain at least one meter on each side of the vehicle to avoid collision, for example, I might do that. I eventually want to make it through the intersection. And what's nice about temporal logic is that you can combine these operators to say uh, more interesting things. Uh, and so, for example, we can say that P implies eventually Q. That means that I should respond to something. Right? Uh, if the light turns green, I should eventually go through the intersection. Right? That might be one way to describe that. Um, I'll skip the next one, uh, but the third one down, always eventually P, this is a way of saying that some should th something should happen over and over and over again. That is, by concatenating these things, I, I say it should eventually be the case that P holds. Right? I should eventually check my rearview mirror, but I don't just want to check it once. I want to check it over and over. But I don't want to be looking only in my rearview mirror. That wouldn't make any sense. Right? So the way that you would say you should you know, continuously check your rearview mirror would be you would say always eventually check your rearview mirror. And that means that at all points in the future, you will eventually check your rearview mirror. Once you've checked it one, at some point in the future, you're going to do it again. So you can see that you can combine these in different ways. If you just flip the order of those two operators, eventually always P, that's like a stability condition. That says that eventually I get inside of a set, right? So think of this like Lyapunov functions. Eventually I reach some Lyapunov level set and I get inside it and I stay inside it, right? So eventually always P, right? Means that we think of that as a stability condition. So temporal logic allows you to describe those types of behaviors. And in fact, it's uh, wonderful for not only uh, autonomous driving and other things, but many types of situations where you have supervisory control or other events that are happening in this kind of discrete way. Now, it's not quite rich enough for many of the things we want to do in control, and that's because we have dynamics that are also associated with our systems, and those dynamics need to be accounted for somehow. So there have been extensions of linear temporal logic to take that into account, in particular metric temporal logic, uh, where you put time bounds on. Uh, we use a variant of that uh, that is essentially equivalent called signal temporal logic. And the idea in signal temporal logic is that we add a couple of operators. In particular, we allow 
real values and comparisons of real values. So I might say I want the value of a Lyapunov function v to be less than some maximum value. Um, we can put time bounds on something. So I might say always in the range t1, t2, some proposition should be true. So between time t1 and t2, I want this proposition to be true, but I don't care after that. And we can do the same with eventually. And so we might say, for example, p implies eventually within time little t, q holds. Right? So not just uh, that if the light turns green, I should go through, but if the light turns green, I should go through within one minute, for example. So signal temporal logic allows a very rich description of these events. There are other ways that you can describe these events, but this particular language we have found to be extremely useful for doing that. And so this idea of using temporal logic then allows us to specify things. So let me give you just one example uh, to kind of show you the types of things you can express and, and what the, the language can do. Um, and that's in the context of a traffic light, so a very simple example. So if, uh, actually I haven't uh, checked here in South Africa, but in many European countries, uh, the sequence that you go through is that a light is green, and then it goes yellow, and then it goes red, and then before it goes green again, the red and yellow turn on at the same time, so that you know it's about to turn uh, green, and you can get, you know, start getting ready, uh, and then you go through. So this is the system that is implemented, the, the uh, finite transition system, or the finite state machine that's doing that. But the question is, if I was specifying here's what a traffic light should do, all right, not giving you the solution, but giving you the specification, uh, what would that look like? And so, for example, you might have ordering specifications. You might have a liveness spec. You say the traffic light is green infinitely often. Right? So that diagram doesn't say you keep going around. The specification does. Right? It says that I, in fact, must always eventually become green. That's a liveness condition for a traffic light. Um, you might have some ordering, so if I'm just specifying the behavior, you'd say once the light is red, uh, it can't become green immediately uh, here because I should turn red yellow first. That's the specification uh, in Europe. And so here's a temporal logic statement that says that. It says it's always the case that if the light is red, that should imply that at the next step it's not green, so not next green. Okay? So that's a temporal logic description uh, of that English language statement. Here's a more detailed one. So once red, the light should always become green eventually, but after being yellow for some time. And then here's a, a description of that in temporal logic. And so I'll let you try and parse that. I've used the U operator. That means until. Uh, that's another temporal logic operator. Um, it's not the only way to specify that. Uh, in fact, for aficionados of uh, linear temporal logic, the specification is, strictly speaking, not true. There's a side case in this that doesn't do what you expect. Uh, and this is actually the correct specification. So one thing you can see is, just like control theory, uh, you have to be careful. You can write down specifications that aren't what you mean. Uh, and so it does take practice to learn this language uh, and to use it well. But again, we found it to be a particularly useful language. So you can do lots of things with it. Um, one of the most common is what's called a progress property. Uh, so we always want it to be the case that if we make a request, then we respond. Right? And that's one of the ways that we uh, get reactive systems. That is, that, uh, if the system, if the environment does something, then I want to react to it. So this idea of using linear temporal logic uh, allows us a mathematical framework uh, in which we can reason about our systems. Now, in our case, we're reasoning about often continuous systems, cars driving around, uh, different, you know, we work in electric power systems for aircraft, and there's voltages and currents and other things. And so we can't just use uh, 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 discrete abstractions. But we can convert things to discrete abstractions. And so one of the things that we need to do is we need to take the differential equations that describe our underlying uh, dynamical system and think about how would I represent that in a discrete abstraction so that I might use these tools from temporal logic. So typically the way that would happen is that we might start, for example, with some uh, discretization of our state space where there are regions that mean something to us in terms of uh, the overall task. So here I've broken it up into three regions. This might be the lane, the intersection, and the other lane or something like that, right? So I need to describe things that I know are going to come up in my specification. Now, um, these kind of big areas, you know, the left lane, the right lane, the intersection, and other things, uh, typically are too coarse to be compatible with the dynamics. That is, we need to refine them further. I need to know where I am in the lane, or I need to know, can I move from one part of the lane to another lane? Uh, and sometimes I can do that in one region of, uh, of one area of my state space, but not another. And so what we'll typically do is break this down uh, into a finer partition. Uh, and we often call this a proposition preserving partition, uh, where the idea is that we've maintained these uh, boundaries between the colored areas uh, in this refined partition because we know that our specifications are going to involve saying things about what happens when you're in this region or this region and we need to preserve that. So once we have a proposition preserving partition we can then ask uh, fine what's the transition system? I can now 
think of these as discrete states. So each of those regions is a discrete state. Uh, there's 15 of them up there or something like that. So now I have a discrete state system with 15 uh, different states, and I need to think about uh, how might they be connected together. And this is, of course, where I use the dynamics. And so we ask a question, can I get from any region, any point in one region, to some point in another region uh, by application of some control. And if I can do that, uh, then I'll say that these regions are connected. And so I can use the dynamics, and we can actually use uh, uh, trajectory generation and other types of techniques to do that, uh, and we can essentially build up a transition system. And in so doing, we basically convert a dynamical system uh, into a finite transition system, obviously with some loss of information, right? I mean, because it's a much more coarse description. But again, we're moving up levels of abstraction, and so when we want to reason at this high level. And in fact, you do this a little bit iteratively, that is what uh, discretization you use depends on the dynamics, and so there are tools to do that. Um, we actually use tools that came out of the model predictive, or the uh, uh, MPT, so the multi-parametric toolbox uh, that came out of Morari's group uh, at ETH in Zurich. So uh, there are very nice techniques for doing that. They can allow you to account for disturbances, uncertainty, uh, other types of things. So they're really very rich. So we can convert these systems one to another. Um, what that allows us to do then is to have two abstractions. We can have a continuous abstraction uh, where we design our continuous controllers, for example, designing trajectories and other things, as well as a discrete abstraction that we can use at the supervisory level. And these two are uh, connected to each other. They're compatible with each other. And so in particular, if I have some trajectory through my continuous system uh, that's here, right, as I follow this around with some application of controls, I will get some trajectory that is consistent with the transition system diagram, uh, and so goes through some finite states here that I've labeled. But it goes the other way, too. That is, at the supervisory level, if I say, fine, go from this region to this region, and then this region to this region, there will exist a continuous controller that, in the continuous domain, takes me between those points. So this notion of similarity or bisimilarity of these systems uh, allows us to uh, move back and forth between these abstractions and know that we're doing things that are still formally correct uh, at the higher levels. So this is the idea of doing uh, these discrete abstractions. Um, once we have a discrete abstraction and we have a temporal logic specification, then we can talk about how do I actually check to make sure that my specification is satisfied by whatever my controller is. And so if I design a supervisory controller using this discrete abstraction in whatever way, human sits down and says, okay, well, here's how I'm going to design a traffic light, or here's the logic that I'm going to use for an intersection, uh, then we can say, okay, well, when is that correct? And uh, a great tool that I have to say that I didn't know enough about uh, 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, uh, that I think we should all be making much more use of uh, is this notion of model checking. So the idea in model checking is simple enough, which is I have some discrete transition system uh, and I have some uh, temporal logic specification, and I like to say is it the case that no matter which transitions I take according to the allowable rules, so I've got some protocol that says at an intersection, you're going to, if there's a car in front of you, you're going to stop, you're going to wait until that car goes through, you're going to drive forward, right? That's implementing transitions in this discrete transition system, and I'd like to make sure that it's always the case that some specification is satisfied. And so model checking does exactly that. And in particular, what model checking does is, given a system model, typically represented uh, as a discrete transition system, but it can also be represented as a behavioral description that is a temporal logic formula that describes what's allowed. And given some system property, so for example, the type of property that I've written at the upper right, what a model checker does is it says, is it the case that every possible execution of my system dynamics, according to this discrete abstraction, satisfy the formula? And he either says, yes, this is true, guaranteed, absolutely, every possible execution does that, or it gives you a counterexample. It says, nope, if the following things occur, if a car comes up at this time and then you move forward and then another car comes up and then the first car does something else, in fact, you will violate your specification. So it's an extremely powerful tool for doing that. As you can imagine, in uh, a discrete transition system, this is a hard problem, right? You're having to look through every possible execution. And in network control systems where you have asynchrony, I have to look at every possible ordering of events, every interleaving of what could happen. What if one sensor sees it first and sends a message before another sensor sees it, right? Does that make a difference or not? And so what the computer science community has done in model checking is to get to do that in extremely efficient ways. And so in the worst case, these can be terrible. Um, so, in fact, uh, what they do is they enumerate all possible execution sequences, and in the worst case, that can be a lot, but they're very efficient in how they do that. And so they do various uh, types of reduction techniques and other things, and they can test systems with up to 100 billion states. So 100 billion discrete states, that's pretty good. Right? So that's kind of the current state of the art. Um, they do that by a number of sophisticated techniques, uh, and so uh, this is coming out of Baron Katoon and sort of describing exactly what goes on. And in fact, the way that they do this is that they uh, try and assert the negative. That is, they say, here's a system, 
and I claim that you cannot find a trajectory that violates this constraint. And then they go through and they search and find a trajectory that violates that constraint. And if, after enumerating every possible uh, thing that could happen, they can't find such a um, uh, counterexample, then they say, indeed, this property is true. So it's really an amazing technology uh, and one I think that can be used in many places. And uh, we heard a lot on Tuesday about safety critical systems. This is one of the things uh, that people who worry about safety critical systems, for example, in aerospace, are increasingly beginning to use as an integral part. So those of you in the US who've done uh, flight control know that there's something called DO-178C, which is the FAA certification that handles flight software. And it now allows credit for these formal methods, for, so for model checking as a way of uh, verifying that a system operates correctly. So uh, this is an extremely powerful technique uh, and one that we can make use of uh, when we have these discrete abstractions. Okay, so just as an example of the type of thing that you might want to verify, I'm showing the, the navigation stack over here on the right, uh, showing the mission planner all the way down uh, to the lower levels. And the finite state machine that you see is actually the logic that we use for driving in a road region within Alice. Uh, and so it's got a bunch of cryptic looking states. It's basically a, a state chart uh, that describes what can go on. And then there's one of those that says when you go into an intersection region, go to a different state chart. And there's another one when you go you know, into uh, some uh, abnormal mode, there might be a different state chart. So these are the sorts of things that we want to verify. Now, in fact, these are happening not just at these higher levels of abstraction, uh, but also at these lower levels of abstraction. So even if you're sort of not worrying about the high levels, you might have some things that are going on at the low level. So just one example of that, uh, you can't read this, but this is a diagram for what's going on at the actuation interface. We had some very low level uh, uh, finite state logic that was there so that DARPA in the DARPA Grand Challenge could send us a pause signal that said the vehicle had to pause and we had to guarantee that no matter what the vehicle was doing it would come to a stop and stay at a stop. And so, and then when you get unpaused you have to come back and start operating again and you have to worry about the fact that you don't know exactly when that pause command is going to come in. Uh, it could come in at any time while you're in the middle of shifting or reversing or doing different things. And so we had a little finite state machine that kept track of what state we were in. Uh, and we could write down temporal logic specifications, and I'm showing some actual temporal logic specifications that we used. And you don't need to read them in detail, but what you can see is that they use the little uh, funny looking diamonds and squares, right? So always something is true, always e stop disable implies eventually always state is disabled and acceleration is minus one. That says that if we get a disable command, it will eventually be the case that we will disable the vehicle and come to a stop, that's the uh, ACC equals minus one, and stay there forever. That's a pretty important property to have be true when you're operating uh, on a course like this. And so we were actually able to use uh, model checking tools to do this. Uh, we used something called TLC that Leslie Lamport wrote, uh, same Lamport as LaTeX, uh, and uh, we're able to go and uh, sort of verify these sorts of properties at different layers. So model checking as a tool is great. Um, it is a, a design then verify uh, policy. So this finite state machine is one that a person actually put together. Uh, I use this example because the person was me. Um, so I actually, you know, sort of designed this system, right? Uh, the more, much more complicated, more interesting one at the top was designed by Nock. Um, and so, you know, I asserted that this one was correct uh, until one day we were driving and we got a pause command in the middle of shifting uh, and one part of the computing system thought that we were in reverse and another part thought that we were in forward. Uh, and so when the system said resume, uh, then the car started, uh, was commanded to drive forward, it started driving backwards, the error got bigger so it tried to drive forwards faster, uh, and so we actually peeled out in a 6,000 ton van going in reverse. Right? And then somebody said, Richard, I don't think your finite state machine is correct. Right? And so despite my assertions and, you know, Professor Murray, respectfully, sir, uh, you screwed up. Right? Um, and so you'd like to be able to do that uh, in a little bit more systematic way, and model checking allows us to do that. So uh, I think it's a great thing. Um, but many systems are designed so that they're so complicated that even with the power of model checking, uh, we can't really do it. And furthermore, it doesn't give any guidance. It's like, okay, you design it, you get a counterexample, okay, let me think about that for a little while, you know, how might I do it? And, you know, in controls, that's not the way we do things. In controls, often, what we'll do is we'll say, look, you give me a description of the system, x dot equals ax plus bu. You give me a specification of what you want. I'd like to minimize the integral of x transpose uh, qx plus u transpose ru synthesize a controller that does that, u equals kx. And by the way, I want it to be stable, right, and various other properties. And so this is not, it's not like you go design the gains and then see whether or not they satisfy the conditions for them. That's not the way we do it, right? You synthesize that. So one of the questions we want to ask was, well, can't we do that here? Can't we synthesize the logic, right, rather than uh, trying to do it by hand? And again, this is feedback logic. We have to react to the system. It should be a feedback uh, control design problem. 
And so, uh, the, oh, sorry, so one last thing is to say that uh, these techniques, right, allow us to apply this to hybrid systems and other things. Uh, and so uh, there's a technique for doing that, and I'll show it to you uh, again in a second. Okay, so but what we'd like to do is not just verify these systems, sort of as on the left, where I have formal specifications in a system model, but actually synthesize them. And I'd like the synthesis algorithm to either give me a controller, right, a finite state machine that satisfies the spec, or tell me that no such controller exists. Your specification is actually not satisfiable. And so we'd like to understand how you might do that. And if we didn't have dynamics at all, or if we abstracted the dynamics away and just looked at a discrete transition system, in fact, the computer science community has looked at this, and we can make use of uh, some of the techniques they've done. Uh, and in particular, this notion of reactive synthesis is very relevant. OK, so the synthesis problem, I think, is one that's uh, very interesting. Um, and here's kind of a block diagram for how that looks. And of course, this block diagram should look familiar to absolutely everybody in the room, right? It's a control system, as I've been saying over and over. Um, that E up there, you might think of that as a delta block, like an uncertainty block, right? And it's your environment, right? That's the disturbance, right? I don't control the external environment. I have to react to the external environment. And so here, the thing to remember is that this is a discrete system. So my plant P takes commanded actions, makes a discrete change in state. It's now at a new state. The environment can see that state. Maybe my controller can see that state. The environment can do something. What it does may affect uh, what I do. The controller can do something. Right? That will affect what I can do. And then we keep iterating. But we really want to think of this as how would you synthesize a robust, with respect to the environment's behavior, controller that satisfies a specification. And our specification is going to be a temporal logic specification. So, in general, uh, this is very hard. Uh, it turns out that it's doubly exponentially complex in the size of the specification. So two to the two to the number of clauses in your specification. So if I only had five rules for my specification, then the amount of time it would take is two to the two to the fifth. That's two to the 30 seconds. So two to the 30 second microseconds or something like that, depending on your computation, probably could do it. All right? If I just doubled the spec, we go to two to the two to the 10th. That's two to the 1,000th, right? So that takes eternity, right? So I think a lot of the reason that uh, not much has been done in synthesis of control protocols is it's just, you know, the curse of dimensionality is even worse, right, than we're used to. It is just awful. And so uh, when we had been looking at this, you know, maybe 10 years ago now, that was sort of where we stopped. Okay, well, fine, you know, for anything interesting, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, but something changed, uh, and what changed was uh, that this paper in 2005 uh, by Pitterman, Punuali, and Saar looked at a special class of uh, temporal logic specifications, which could be solved much more efficiently. And they called this class GR1 for general reactivity one. Uh, and it was in particular motivated by Pinuali's work in reactive protocols. And so GR1 specifications, and I'll show you one in a second, are different. But also the formalism is a little bit different. The way we think about the problem we're trying to solve is a little bit different. And in particular, the way that it's set up is, because it's reactive, it's set up sort of as a game. And the game is set up in a way in which the controller gets to see the environment's action. And the controller gets to decide what to do based on what the environment's going to do. Now, you have to decide whether or not you get to see the output of the uncertainty block right, in your system or not. But for many of the systems we're dealing with, right, autonomous vehicles and motion planning and other types of aerospace systems that we work on, um, it's not a bad assumption to assume that you can observe the environment around you and then, based on what the environment does, react to it. And in driving, that's very much what we all do. Uh, and so it's not a bad uh, uh, way of looking at it. And it allows a certain approach to be used uh, that uh, gives you more efficiency. And in particular, the way that we think about this is it's a sort of non-symmetric game. Uh, and so what happens is that the environment, that gray box, decides what it's going to do based on its knowledge of the plant if it wants to. Sometimes the environment doesn't care what the plant is doing. Sometimes it does. Depends on the application. Uh, and then it tells the controller here's what I'm going to do, and then the controller can decide what to do, and then both the plant and the controller implement their action at the same time. So the, the uh, sorry, the environment and the controller implement their action at the same time, the plant reacts to that, and then we go back and we do the environment again. So that is a change, right, in the semantics. So it's not like in game theory we think about, you know, either one can happen first and they're completely symmetric. It's asymmetric in that sense. But in, at least in driving, the case where we were looking at, it's not a bad assumption to assume that the world works that way. It just means that I can look and see what you're going to do and make a decision about that. And then if you change what you're going to do, fine. I have to look again, right, and change what I'm going to do. So it's not a terrible assumption. Um, so, but what that does is uh, it changes the nature of what we can do. And in particular, for certain classes of specifications, we go from being doubly exponentially complex in the size of the specification to cubically complex in the number of states. 
So cubically complex is, of course, hugely better than doubly exponential, right? And so if I have a million states, right, so 10 to the 6 states, I might get something that's 10 to the 18th, that's too big, but if I can get it down to, you know, 1,000 states or 10,000 states, right, I can, you know, do this at the level of what model checkers are able to do, for example. So there's still challenges in this, and I'll tell you how we overcome some of those, but this essentially makes it uh, realizable. And this is a very new result. We learned about this result in 2007, and it completely changed the direction of our research. It's like somebody telling you that some, you know, major open problem uh, is a convex problem, right? It's like you go, oh, it's convex. Now we know how to solve it. Better yet, it's a linear programming problem, right? Ah, we can solve it for really big systems. So it has that kind of a flavor to it. So the class of specifications that this works for, there are different ways of writing it. I've written one of them down below. Uh, and you see that this looks something like uh, what I showed you before. Um, and so uh, I'll read it for you. It says that uh, the, uh, there should be some proposition about the initial environmental state, phi init, and the environment should always satisfy some other proposition, so always phi safe. <coughs> phi safe here is called a safety condition. Uh, for example, uh, we might say that it's always the case uh, that uh, cars... Uh, that are driving around us have to obey the laws of physics, right? They can't accelerate more than a certain amount and things like that. Um, uh, there's a progress command, so always eventually fee progress says that the environment will always do something. So if a car stops in the middle of an intersection, eventually it will get out of the middle of the intersection, right? Otherwise, you can't satisfy the spec. And on the right-hand side, basically the same types of things for the system. The system should satisfy some initial conditions, uh, it should have some safety constraints, and it should have some liveness constraints. And so we get this assume guarantee format. If we assume something about the environment, then we can guarantee something about the system. And we can synthesize these controllers cubically in the number of states that are required to describe the overall system dynamics. And that turns out to be efficient enough to use. And so uh, this result uh, for us just completely changed the way we think about what we can do and said, why don't we just synthesize the controllers at the top level? Why does Richard have to go uh, and be humiliated by uh, implementing bugs in his finite state machine, right, when he can go and apply this uh, uh, synthesis tool? And like all synthesis tools, it relies on models. And so if your model is wrong, then you're going to have potentially uh, wrong things happen. And we're used to dealing with that. There's always a gap in what we do. Uh, and I think the controls community is very used to dealing with that. And again, I'd just like to emphasize, these are feedback control protocols that are doing this as the uh, environment reacts. What should I do? Taking into account that my action now will affect what I do in the future. All right, so let me say a little bit about how these go. I'm going to give you a very, very simple example to kind of illustrate how you might synthesize these. And so this is a runner blocker example. It's due to Pinelli. Uh, and so in the diagram on the left, uh, you see uh, two agents, the runner labeled by an R, uh, is uh, in blue, and the runner can go either up or down. Eventually, it wants to get to the goal state, labeled by the G on the right. So it wants to move to the right. Uh, the blocker is in red, and the blocker has three positions that it can be at. It can either be at the top, the middle, or the bottom, and it can move back and forth between these. And of course, what the runner's trying to do is get to the goal, and what the blocker's trying to do is block it by running into it. And uh, the uh, idea is to say, can I formulate a control protocol? And this problem is simple enough, so the goal is eventually G, right? So that's it. That's the whole uh, spec. Um, the runner is allowed to move up and down. Uh, sorry, the blockers are allowed to move up and down. The runner is allowed to, you know, move where the blue arrows say. So if we want to synthesize a controller for this, then what we do is that we enumerate all of the possible states of the system. And of course, I've chosen one that's ridiculously simple, uh, in part so that I can put the states on one uh, PowerPoint chart. Uh, and so these are all the possible states. So if you look at these diagrams, they have blue and red in some spot, and these are all of the possible states where blue and red can be. And given these states, we can then look at the transitions. So the red transitions means the environment takes a move. The blue transition means that the system takes a move. And so these are all of the possible executions, right? So the question that we want to ask is, can I choose a control policy? Notice that if I have a given state and there are two blue arrows coming out, I have to decide which blue arrow I choose. That's my control policy, right? In this state, what action do I choose? Right? And I want to choose a control policy such that I always get to the bottom state, which is the winning state. So we label these states. So we have an initial state. Uh, we have losing states. Those are ones where the blocker and the runner are at the same position. Uh, and then we have a winning state at the bottom. And so what we want to do is we want to synthesize a protocol to get there. Right? It's clear you can find a path to get there, but the path might require that the environment do the right thing. We want to know if no matter what the environment does, can I always get there. And so the way that GR1 synthesis works is very easy in this particular case, but it generalizes to the formulas I've shown. And we start by saying, well, what's the final winning condition that I want to get to? And we say, okay, well, that winning condition is down here, and I'm going to call that set R0. This is the set of all states that if I get there and I stay there, they satisfy my specification. 
Now, of course, from there, I can ask the question, okay, well, what are the sets of states that if the environment takes an action, I can find a system action such that I end up in this set of states? And so we do an iteration. We say, now find the set of states that can lead me to R0. And that would be the set of states R1. And in particular, notice that, in this case, it's really easy. If I start in any of the states in R1, then if the environment takes an action, for example, if I start in the leftmost state within R1, uh, the environment can only do one thing. Uh, it can move down, and if it moves down, right, then I uh, kind of take the arrow. Uh, it, it, uh, the blocker moves down, and if the blocker moves down, I move into the goal position. Right? So that's that uh, path. And now I can say, good, now I've got R1. That's essentially a winning set. If I start in that set, then I can win the game. So now, let me iterate. And so what are the set of states from which I can get to R1? And that gives us R2, actually labeled it as R3 here. Um, and this is the set of states uh, from which I can, in two steps, get there. And this state includes my initial state. So at this point, I can stop and say, OK, I have a solution. So, and what you really do is you tend to run it until you get no new states. So it's a fixed point operation. And in fact, you're, you're looking at an operator, and you're looking for a fixed point of that operator. The operator is you t the environment takes a step, you take a step, and you're looking for a fixed point of this operator, and you start this iteration on a winning set. And that's what's actually going on underneath. I've shown it here in a very, very simple example. You could have come up with a strategy, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it does that. And I'd like you to notice that this is actually a strategy. Uh, that is, that when I start at some state, by going to the next lower level, I'm choosing my action. That is, if I started a state in R3, I know I want to go to R2 or R1 in this case, right? And so if the environment takes me someplace, then I say, what action do I need to apply to go to the next level? And in this sense, this is like a Lyapunov function, right? It's like following the gradient of a Lyapunov function, right? But here in this reactive synthesis context. So this uh, example uh, is, makes use of a set of mathematics called mu calculus. It's a, it's a calculus of fixed points uh, for satisfying these sorts of specifications. It's a very beautiful mathematical theory, and it allows us to uh, say how complicated are different types of formulas, how complicated are different fragments of LTL. Uh, and so in particular for these GR1 programs, this is the techniques that you, that's used. Uh, and it gives us a strategy, right? That is, it says at every state, uh, given what the environment does, here's what you should do in response. OK, so let me uh, kind of end by showing you some examples of this uh, and sort of saying a little bit about where we're going. Um, and the example I'll use, we'll come back to uh, looking at uh, Alice. Uh, and so uh, in an urban environment, right, we might have the following type of problem. So if you look at the diagram on the upper right, uh, here it's a car. It's driving through some road network. Uh, and you see there are two red stars. And the idea is that what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, go to those two red stars over and over and over. So I'm a bus route. Those are my two stops, right? My job is to go back and forth between those two things. In other words, I'd like to always eventually go to the left star and always eventually go to the right star. That's my spec. Um, now, I have to understand, uh, you know, can I drive in any lane, right? What can I do? And so we have some traffic rules. These are additional specs. And you shouldn't collide with other vehicles. And you should stay in your travel lane unless something's blocking you and you're passing, right? So these are the road rules, essentially, that we use. Uh, so you can think of this as the, if you're in California, we have the California Driver's Handbook. Uh, and it's just a bunch of rules that look like this. And each of these rules is something that we can write down as a temporal logic statement. Now, we have to assume something about the environment. We're not driving on the road all by ourselves. There were other cars that were out there, and we have to make some assumptions about them. And so I've listed some of the types of assumptions that you might do here. And so, for example, I'm going to say an obstacle can't block a road. Right? So if an obstacle blocks an entire road, then a couple of obstacles might block all roads, and it will no longer be possible for me to satisfy my route because the roads are all blocked. So if I try and synthesize something in which I allow the environment to block all roads, right, it's going to give me a counterexample and say, oh, well, if roads uh, 4, 2, and 5 are all blocked, right, then you can't satisfy the spec anymore. Right? In fact, if, if, road, if road 5 is completely blocked, you can't satisfy. So I say, look, I'm going to assume that the roads aren't blocked. Right? Or maybe I'm going to assume that they're eventually not blocked. That would be a different type of spec. Similarly, uh, we can put in specifications about I have to, if I'm not going to collide with things, I have to be able to detect them before they get too close. Um, there are a couple here that I'll point out. The obstacle does not disappear when the vehicle is in its vicinity, the fourth one down. So why is that there? That's there because one of my rules was that I stay in my travel lane unless there's an obstacle blocking that lane. And if obstacles can suddenly disappear, I might move to pass, and suddenly this obstacle disappears, and now I'm not in my travel lane, but I could have been. Why aren't you there? But this is a reasonable assumption, right? I mean, obstacles 
uh, you know, don't um, uh, disappear means that, you know, they have mass, they have to move, right? They have to actually move out of the way. They can't just poof, disappear somehow. Um, another one, uh, the next to the last one, for example, is that we're going to assume that uh, intersections are clear infinitely often. Why? Because we had a specification that says we're going to have to proceed, oops, excuse me, proceed through intersections, and in proceeding through those intersections, we have to uh, make some assumption about the fact that it'll uh, be possible. So I've written on the left a bunch of words, but uh, in fact, what I'm really writing is a specification like the one on the lower right. That is, uh, it is precisely a specification in GR1 form. So since it's a specification in GR1 form, I can actually synthesize a controller for this that tells me how to drive in urban environments. And so that's what we did. Uh, and so here I'm going to show you a simulation of this. Um, so uh, what you're going to see is, is a movie uh, that does this. And uh, what we're implementing essentially is the uh, uh, traffic planner, what road do we stay in, et cetera, sitting on top of uh, a dynamical system. We have constraints on how fast the vehicle could drive, how much we can turn the steering wheel, all of those things. So we've abstracted that into one of these finite transition systems, synthesized a controller. And then when we say, I want you to move, you know, sort of one grid down so the, the discretization is not what you see there. Uh, that's the proposition preserving partition. The discretization is much finer. I'll say a little about it, but won't show it to you. Um, the red block that you see on the left-hand side is an obstacle. You're going to see obstacles pop in and pop out. Um, and the reason they're going to pop in and pop out is we're only going to show you obstacles that we see. That is that when we pass an obstacle, we're no longer looking at it, and so you're going to see it disappear. doesn't mean it disappeared. just means that uh, it's no longer in your sensing range. And you're not going to see all of the obstacles on the grid. You're only going to see those obstacles that are within your sensing range, which here is about three of those blocks ahead of you. So what do we do? We wrote all of the things down. We synthesize this. I'll say that even for this problem, if I were to try and synthesize a single reactive controller for the entire problem, it would be too complicated. Why? Because any of those blocks might be occupied by an obstacle or not, and any of the intersections might be occupied in other things. And so the number of possible states of the environment, if I don't constrain things at all, is huge, right? At a minimum, it's two to the number of blocks that are there. There are probably 50 blocks there, two to the 50th. That's probably too big, right? That cubed is too big a synthesis problem. So we do another trick, very standard, everybody in control, which is we use receding horizon. That is, we say, look, you know, we don't need to figure out what to do for the entire time. What we really need to figure out what, how to do is, how do I do something for the next 20 meters that puts me in a position where I can keep going? And then I'll move forward a meter and then do it again. I'll move forward a meter and do it again. Now, one of the things that implies is that, in fact, I need to synthesize my reactive controllers in real time. Right? Just like you, for model predictive control or receding horizon control, right, we have to do the optimization. And that seems ridiculous, because I already said these aren't super simple problems. But it's the same as receding horizon. The thing is, I know what my environment is. I don't have to solve it for any environment. I have to solve it for those that are consistent with my measurements. So I know a lot more about the environment. And I don't have to solve it for any initial state. I only have to solve it for my current initial state. And that minimizes the amount of computation I have to do. And in fact, we use a program called TULIP to do that. And we can synthesize in about 1.5 seconds on a standard laptop the strategy to use. And we get a 900 state, a 900 state finite state machine that implements that strategy. Right? And 900 states seems like a lot right, for something that seems so simple. But the point is that it's enumerating all the possible environmental actions and what it would do in each case, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, based on what it sees so far. OK, so let me show you what this does. Uh, so if we uh, start driving, we see an obstacle, we move into another lane. When we can move back into our lane, we move back into our lane. We get to the intersection. The intersection is occupied. We know eventually it will be free. As soon as it's free, we go through the intersection. Remember, we're trying to get to uh, bus stops on the left and right. We go to this intersection. It was empty. We go past one bus stop, pick up passengers or something like that, keep driving down the street, come up, go to the next bus stop, come back around, and do it again. Right? Very easy. All right, now, all of a sudden, something happened. There's an obstacle crossing the entire road. Now, you should think about, well, that's not allowed, right? I said that obstacles can't block an entire road. That was one of my environmental assumptions. So what happened was that I had environmental assumptions implies controller uh, uh, guarantees. The environmental assumption is false, so that formula is true, right? Because if I say, you know, if something, then something, if the if part is false, the statement is true. And so at this point, the environment has, uh, is no longer satisfying its spec. So what do we do? Well, we don't remember this is in a hierarchy of controllers. Uh, and in fact, we don't stop there. Uh, what we do, in fact, is uh, that we're sitting at this traffic planner level, but there's a level above us. And we say, hey, mission manager, 
it's not possible, the environment you know, didn't satisfy its spec, you need to tell me to do something different. And that mission manager might say, you know what, if the entire road is blocked, normally you're not allowed to do this because you're in the middle of a road, but I'll let you uh, turn around. And so I'll enable the possibility that you might actually do a U-turn. And so when we enable that possibility, then uh, we recommand what goes down, we change the model, the system uh, does the next thing, right, and it goes around, finds obstacles, avoids them, et cetera. And so this is a controller now. It's a, it is a bunch of controllers. Uh, those controllers include continuous controllers that are regulating the path, uh, receding horizon controllers that are planning the path, other receding horizon controllers that are doing the finite state machine and giving us these reactive protocols in response to the types of specifications I showed. Okay, so um, that demonstrates some of the types of things that we can do uh, with these systems. Um, uh, I'll say that uh, there are uh, tools for doing this. Uh, so uh, there are many software packages. We have one that we call Tulip. Uh, it's an open source package. You're welcome to not only use it, but contribute to it. It handles GR1 specifications, LTL uh, uh, specifications, nonlinear dynamics. Uh, it actually solves out for the discretization automatically. I mean, it really does a lot of this for you. Um, so you give it a system model, you give it a system specification, it gives you a continuous controller that is a uh, optimal trajectory controller for moving from one region to another, as well as the supervisory controller that tells you what regions and what mode changes should you do. And we've applied this to a number of different applications. Today, I've only told you about motion planning applications. We've also applied it to things like distributed camera networks for surveillance. We've applied it to electric power systems and aircraft. Uh, so we've applied it in a number of different places. Uh, we've applied it to generate protocols for vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle, uh, uh, communication networks. There's a number of places where you can use this that fit within this GR1 specification. And so I do think that it is a type of control design uh, that we can do. Okay, so let me end there. So I've, I've sort of motivated this by this story about Alice the truck and, and some of the uh, difficulties and things that were hard to design. And since 2007, we've been spending our time trying to develop some of the tools that might allow us to, the next time a DARPA grand challenge of this sort comes along, uh, to do it in a better way. Um, we've done that by uh, designing a, a, a layer, set of layers of abstractions uh, as we go, and so this supervisory control layer is the one I told you about, interacting with the dynamics happening at the trajectory generation layer, but of course there are feedback control layers below that, uh, and the environment uh, interacting with all of that. So this is an area that very much uh, is, uh, I think, has lots of interesting future things to do. So just figuring out what are the right abstraction layers and what are the interfaces between those. How do we synthesize reactive protocols, not for LTL specs, which is what I showed you, but for STL specs, that is those that have uh, time bounds on some parts of them. Uh, and so some of those are things that you can actually convert uh, into uh, mixed logical dynamical systems, and you can use some of the tools there. Other ones are not of that form. And so how do we get a general class of what we can do? Um, how do we deal with uncertainty and robustness? I've described uncertainty in the environment, but what if there's other uncertainties, transitions that might suddenly appear or something like that? How do we do robustness with respect to things that we don't have in our model, right, and we only have some sort of bounds on? Some of that comes for free uh, in the environmental stuff. And there are lots of other directions. How do you scale this? How do you do incremental stuff? How do you do probabilistic stuff? Uh, and there's, uh, you know, dozens of groups around the world that are working on this, but I think it's a big area with lots more to do. Okay, so uh, let me stop there. I hope I've given you some sense about uh, some of what these techniques can do, um, and I hope uh, maybe uh, convince some of you that if you don't already know about uh, temporal logic model checking uh, and reactive synthesis, that these maybe are things that you should go learn a little bit more about, and they it might be useful in the problems that you're working on, depending on what you're doing. So I'd like to uh, just end by, again, uh, thanking two people, Nakhwang Piramsarm and Ufuk Topku, uh, because they were really uh, my partners in developing all of this, uh, and we've uh, taught a short course uh, based on uh, some of this, uh, and, and uh, they've been uh, just tremendous uh, collaborators in this, uh, and the funding agencies that help support the work. So with that, I thank you very much. As probably all of you know that uh, we cannot allow any uh, questions in this plenary session. Uh, please join me uh, to thank again Professor Richard Murray for his excellent and uh, very exciting uh, talk.